continue. Okay, great. So um, Ian is a friend of mine and um, a very intelligent and talented individual. Um, Ian is an editor, an architectural designer, um, and you're currently a student at Harvard GSD. Um, would you like to say anything else about yourself, Ian? Um, just that I'm super excited for the invitation to come join the studio when Adam sent me the syllabus. I was telling him repeatedly, like, I wish I could take this class because it sounds so great. So I'm happy to be involved in, in whatever capacity. Um, yeah, thanks, Adam. Thank you. Um, yeah, also your hair looks good today. Oh, um, for some reason you got way quieter. I don't know if you're speaking right now. Oh, I, I walked away. I walked away. Okay. Your hair looks good. Um, okay, so yes, the students have downloaded Clo. Their laptops are open, Sweet. and um, now we. I think you can just get started if you're ready. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so the drive link was shared with everyone as well. I'll I'll just copy it again to the chat just to make sure everyone has it. Um, there's a few files in there we'll be working off of, and if you haven't downloaded. Um, the, the folder already would be helpful if you could now. We won't use the files for a little bit, but we will in a few minutes. Um, and then in that drive folder, there's a Google Doc called, called Clo Tutorial Part 1, which is like a kind of exhaustive um, walkthrough of basically everything that I'm going to be doing. So you can kind of just scroll along as we go. And if there are um, questions down the line as you might return to some of these operations, feel free to just make comments in the Google Doc and I'll get a kind of email notification and can attend to them if there's still confusion. Um, but just to start, so a little bit about Clo. So Clo is a 3D garment simulation software um, that essentially allows you to do anything you would do to a physical textile, um, but in digital space. So you can draft patterns, so drape, shear, manipulate, plot, et cetera, et cetera, um, with very high fidelity. It's one of the better sort of soft body um, simulation tools out there. Uh, and a lot of architects like David Eskenazi, who I think is coming later um, in a few months for this studio, as well as other um, Sarah Crackley, Mir Henry, Matthew Al have been sort of playing around with this software for a few years. Um, and I, we will continue to uh, sort of as well, exploring the sort of um, architectural applications of softness and textiles. Um, also at the top of the document, um, there are a series of useful commands um, that you guys might be returning to again and again. Um, so keep that in mind. But first, if everyone could just open flow, I'm going to now share screen. Oh, you need to enable screen sharing. Oh, okay, great. Okie dokie. Everyone should be able to do it now. Okay. Cool. So screen should be sharing now. Um, if you've opened Clo, it should look something like this. I'm going to go through a little bit in terms of just some settings set up. Um, so first we'll go to the setting bar um, and we'll go to user settings. And oh, actually, before we do that, so I'll just give you a kind of basic overview of what you're looking at in the software. So there are essentially two main viewports in Clo. One is the 3D viewport on the left, and the other is the 2D pattern window, where you'll have um, the sort of 2D patterns of all of your um, garments and textiles. Um, one of the things that's kind of annoying when using Clo or switching between different design softwares in general is like panning, scrolling, zooming, et cetera, is different. If you guys are on using a Windows computer and have a mouse and you're not using a trackpad, it should just be um, right click to rotate, um, press the scroll wheel to pan, and then zoom is just scrolling in and out with the scroll wheel, which is more or less the same as Rhino. Um, if, if, if it's doing something different for you, you can go into um, settings, user settings, like I was doing before, and view controls, and you can set um, what you want all of those to be such that it's easy for you to navigate around. If for whatever reason you're more familiar with like Maya or 3ds Max conventions, you can just switch to those. Um, but if pan panning around and moving around is working well for you, just ignore the view controls to now. For now, the, um, the only thing we'll do here is just change the user interface 
unit system to inches. Um, and then the, the other thing is in preferences, we're going to change the way the gizmo, which is what they call the gumball uh, in Clo, is, is set up, and we're going to change it to world coordinates. Uh, and then there are these tabs on the right that you can collapse um, and expand library history, um, modular configurator, object browser, and, and property editor. Most of the time, I just leave those flat so I have maximum sized um, viewports. And with that, we're going to get into the first part of the tutorial, which is importing an object um, like you guys would be doing um, for this first assignment, and then draping a text file over it. So if you have downloaded um, the associated files from the Google Drive, the one that we'll be opening now by going file um, import obj will be in the subfolder obj close rack. We'll open that and then we'll change some of the import settings. So load type will be add instead of open. The scale, you guys will probably have to switch it to inches. 100%, and then it's important to click the align bottom to ground that just snaps it to the zero on the ground plane. Um, and then it'll come in. Uh, and so now what we're going to do, now that we have our kind of as found artifact, is we're going to do, um, we're going to drape a cloth over it. And so this is where we're going to use the 2D pattern window for the first time. Um, and we can decide kind of what geometry we want for our um, cloth. If we go to the on the, the left-hand column over here, if there's one down, we'll go to, oh, sorry, fourth one down. We can choose, and also you, you have to click and hold in order to choose options for buttons, which is kind of annoying, a little bit different from Rhino. So if you just click on it, you won't get um, all the options select to select from. If you click and then can drag between these, we can choose what kind of geometry we want to construct. So let's say we want to do an ellipse, we'll click a center point, let's say we want a 120 inch diameter, um, and then we'll have our claw. Um, we can adjust these by clicking up here, the transform pattern um, and can, can scale, rotate, etc. cetera. Um, and just quickly to go through the other, the other types of geometries, let's say we want to do the polygon, and we're you know using splines. I don't want to make something like that. <clears throat> that also works. So now we're going to go look back at the 3D. Oop. We're going to look back at the 3D viewport. Um, and when it's when the object is selected in the 2D pattern window, a gumball or gizmo will appear um, in the 3D window. And in order to rotate, we'll just snap onto these planes. And you might notice that it doesn't snap to, to 90 degrees. If you hold shift, it'll get sticky and snap to the orientation you want it. Um, and so essentially, we're just going to drag this above our object. Um, and it's also worth noting that keys 1 through 8, um, if you click them, are shortcuts to different um, elevational or corner or plan um, views in the 3D model. And it's also useful if you have something selected um, to press F, which is the, the same as um, Zoom selected in Rhino if you've gotten lost in your workspace. Um, so now we're going to kind of look at the what this geometry is made up of in terms of its sort of vertices and the density of the mesh. Um, if you go here, this is essentially view styles like you know Arctic rendered, etc. In Rhino, we're going to go over to the mesh, and now we can see as we zoom in on our object, um, there's quite a dense mesh on it. If you want to change the density, um, we'll open the property editor while this is selected. And we will go down to simulation properties and we can control the distance. So if we make it um, a, a larger distance, the mesh will be less dense. A smaller distance, the mesh will be more dense. And these are going to have a lot of um, repercussions in terms of how fast or slowly your simulations are going to work. 
So you'll probably be toggling the setting quite a bit as you go through. Um, I think we'll just leave it as 20 for now. Um, and at the top right, the down arrow is the simulation button. And so if we click and hold, like we were doing with some of the other tools, we can select between fast, normal, and fitting. Some of you might not have the, um, the GPU option, but that's fine. Um, the, yeah. We use normal. Oh, yeah? Just a question uh, from a student. Um, um, the question is, how do you find the center point so you can pivot equally? Like when you're, when you're using gumball? When you're using gumball, so when, when it's clicked, it, yeah, it, it's the gumball was not going to the center. It's going to a random point. Uh, it should be if you have the um, the gizmo settings to world coordinate, you should just be clicking on a point in the mesh, and you're rotating around that. Okay, did that work? Okay. Um, it yeah, it'll be figured out. Uh, I think we can proceed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, the, so the gizmo is actually pretty annoying, and I don't know when you guys downloaded Clo, but if you downloaded it this morning instead of yesterday, they just um, did a patch update this morning, and the gumball is kind of scary on it. I was playing around with it with my housemate, um, so you might want to select just one version back and the gumball works a bit more smoothly. Um, but okay. again, just add comments to the document um, if, if stuff is confusing and I can, I can try to attempt to them quickly. Um, but so what we're gonna do now essentially is run the simulation. You can either do it by clicking on the down arrow um, or you can use um, the space bar to stop and start the simulation. So I'm gonna start it now. It's gonna fall. And you'll notice that it's clipping through the really thin frame. Um, this basically only ever happens when the, the geometry it's interfacing with is really, really thin like this. Um, but I wanted us to deal with this challenge so that when it comes, comes along down the line, we'll be able to address it. Um, so what we'll do, because we want to adjust how the simulation is working, is we'll click on the history, which essentially shows everything you've done um, in your workflow so far, and we'll go back to the point before we press the simulate. Um, so the cloth will again be hovering above the object instead of um, falling onto it. And we'll go back to the property editor where we were adjusting the particle distance before. And one really important setting um, that we'll adjust is the additional thickness for collision. Um, Basically, this is like a kind of offset surface from the, the object that the cloth is interacting with, um, such that the cloth bounces off of it. So, and it's also in millimeters. So let's make it like eight or something really big. Um, and then that should work a little better. We'll press spacebar again to run it. See, it's quite a bit better, but it's not perfect. And so there are two ways we can. Um, sort of get it how we want it. One is while the simulation is still running, and if you click and hover over the mesh, the sort of gloved hand appears. And what you can actually do with this is click on any point in the mesh and you can control it. And so in the moments where it's clipping through part of, um, let's say the corner of the clothes rack, uh -oh. <laughs> um, we can try to pull it off of it. That's pretty dope. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's really fun to play around with. It isn't like always perfect, and sometimes it causes more hassle than it's worth. Um, but I wanted to give you guys that option. Um, where I'm going to go back again in the history command before we simulate it. Um, and change one other setting so that the simulation will work a bit better. Um, and that is to change the material that's being used. So 
we will um, open the library tab at the top left. We'll double click on fabric and we will go down to a thicker, more rigid fabric, um, the leather, which is at the bottom of all the knits. And we'll right click, add to workspace, then add it to your object browser. We'll click on our mesh again, open the property editor. And under fabric, which is just below the simulation properties we were playing with before, um, we will change it from fabric one to leather lamb skin. If we want to get in and look at um, the settings within the leather lamp skin itself, we'll open the object browser and we'll double click. Uh, we will click on the leather lamp skin and keep the property editor open at the same time. And you can go down and see there's actually an enormous amount um, of settings related to how each fabric works. Um, but none, none of those are necessarily that important to get to get into right now. But at, if you want to really sort of open up the physical properties of the settings, you can change like how stiff or how stretchy it is in a warp or weft direction. Meaning like when um, when a cloth is woven, it's basically like this, and one is warp and one is weft, um, and you can change the shear, bending, twist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, in each of those dimensions. But for now, we'll just keep the standard leather lambskin, collapse everything, and we will run the simulation one more time, and we should be in pretty good shape now. Okay, sweet. Yeah, so pretty good. Um, once you have a simulation running for final, final fidelity and exports, you can switch by clicking and holding to fitting, which is the highest um, simulation setting and allow the and allow the mesh to settle. And pause the simulation. And if you wanted to, to, for instance, export this back into Rhino or another 3D modeling software, what we would what we would do is click file, export. And you can do either OBJ or FBX. There's not really a difference. Um, I prefer FBX for whatever reason. Um, and let's name this closed rack draped export two. Um, the standard export settings are more or less sufficient. Um, materials will transport between different softwares in both the OBJ and the FBX file types, um, which is very useful, especially if you've applied um, a pattern or something is texture mapped. Um, it's useful to get that to move between the different softwares. So we'll export that and I will and I'll toggle over to the Rhino file. It'd be useful if all of you could download and open the Rhino file now because the next part of the tutorial will be interfacing between the two softwares. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a sample of importing that object, close rack, um, drape export two. So, uh, yeah, pay attention to the uh, unit settings uh, as you do it, but it should it should come in as full scale if you have everything set up correctly. Um, and we have our we have our object. Now the sec the second one to join its friend over here. Um, and now we're going to actually play with a pattern that is drafted in Rhino and physically sew it in close. So I have two different workflows of doing that. The first we'll start with is um, a slightly more complex sort of quilt that'll drape around this close rack. Um, and I think we'll, we'll see how the tutorial you guys are doing next week with like physical sewing and pattern making goes, and then try to um, adopt some of those techniques into the digital workflow. But for now, uh, it's like really, really simple uh, rhino patterns. And so I, you know, I've hung a plane uh, over the clothes rack and punched a hole in it. And then I've, you know, made 2D. And then I've also created uh, a few additional lines that I want to create as sub, like kind of sub, sub segments or pockets of 
the quilt and I also actually changed the, the cutout to a square because um, the way in which the, the circular geometries export into flow can sometimes be a little bit troubling. Um, but essentially what we'll do once we have some sort of pattern um, in Rhino is we'll isolate it, zoom select, and we will print export it. Um, and so in, in CLA, and right now you guys are working at kind of object scale, so it's probably fine to work in full scale, but as, as you continue to play with these simulations and maybe get to building scale, CLO is very, very biased to kind of garment scale simulation. So you'll likely have to work at like one to five, one to 25, et cetera, depending on how large the building is. Um, because this quilt itself is kind of big, we have to do some scalar operations as we export it here. Um, and so in the print setup, oh, which is in the wrong window, in the print setup, there's some settings we want to make sure we have on. Vector output, um, print color, top, and then we'll make sure that it's scaled, in this case, as 1 to 25. Again, you'll have to adjust scales um, and pay attention to them depending on the size of your object. Um, and then also don't go ahead and print the background color. So we'll print that. I already have a file. Um, that's just this exact export in, in the drive already called close rack quilt pattern. So I won't save over that. I'll just toggle back to CLO. Um, at this point, I'll delete that mesh and we are going to start sewing the new one. So again, we'll go file import, but instead of doing OBJ, we're doing Adobe AI or PDF. Um, Illustrator files also work fine. I find it's just easier to print directly to a PDF. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to put a glass of water. Throat is scratching. Right. <clears throat> okay, so I will import my closed rack quilt pattern. Um, we will do in the import a PDF dialog box that comes up, we will do it as add. We will make sure that the scale is at an inch. And depending on how we're scaling things, it, it in this case, will be 100%. Um, but for instance, if you export something really small, you might need to blow it back up to play to play with it correctly in, um, in CLO. And then we'll have on import as baselines as well as import as internal shapes. <laughs> and when you do that, the pattern should come in as <clears throat> a sort of physical mesh object already, as well as the line work in the 2D pattern window. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I have a scratchy throat today. Um, the first thing we'll notice is that our hole didn't come through, we're going to need to actually cut it out. The easiest way to do this is to click and drag select in the 2D pattern window, just the line work that we want to use to cut. Once we have it selected, we'll right click on the line work itself um, and go all the way down to cut. It'll look almost as if nothing happened, but you'll notice as you hover over to select, um, it's cut out this piece of fabric. Um, which we don't need now. So we're going to just press delete to delete it. Um, we're going to click on this guy again and gumball will come up. And what we're going to do is just rotate and move it over somewhere above the clothes rack so that it can drape on top of it. Um, one thing that's useful to know is that Right now it's a plane, but depending on how you're sewing stuff, sometimes you might need things to bend, which this will probably come in more handy in the second tutorial. Um, and you can go down to the second to the last command down here, which is fold arrangement. And you can use um, line work to bend the mesh. 
could continue to do that um, based on what construction lines you have. Uh, for the purpose of this pattern, we're not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is basically copy this plane of textile and make a second one and then sew them together such that we can fill the space between the two of them with pressure as a kind of balloon. Um, and to do that, we will select all of the mesh here. Again, we will right click. And this time we will select symmetric pattern with sewing. And now a kind of ghostly second version of that line work um, should follow your cursor and just drag it over to right by the original. You'll see that this has now come in in the 3D report as well. And what we're going to do, um, oh, also these are now sort of parametrically linked. So if we were going to adjust, is your GPU overloaded? Uh oh. <laughs> Did Zoom crash? Are you? <laughs> oh no. Um. Oh, <laughs> Ian's computer crashed. <laughs> um, is my computer functioning? <laughs> uh, I can hear you still. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, Ian's computer crashed. Um, can I kick? In uh, remove. Wait. Okay, cancel. Um, all right. Um, yeah. So Ian's going to rejoin uh, in a in a couple minutes, and we will continue <laughs> the tutorial. Um, how's it going for everyone? Is it going okay? Yeah, this the simulation is really great. Um, Ian's going to show you how it simulates um, pressure. So, like, if you're thinking of stuffing your fabric with a plush polyfill stuffing, or filling it with air or something else like water, maybe um, the, it has the capability to simulate that, um, and so that's. That should be quite helpful for visualization and drawing of this stuff um, and uh, a good part of your workflow. Um, welcome back. Hey, welcome back. Was you, did your GPU, did your GPU get overloaded? Every, yeah, everything just froze. It was too much. Hopefully that didn't happen to the students <laughs> as well. Um, <laughs> this is while, while I'm resetting stuff up, this is a good time to pause for any questions that might have shown up so far. Sure. Any any um I uh just uh, had a question about the, the last part that you were talking about. I think you were talking about the parametric linking between the two. Yeah. And the question was how to do that or how, how yes. it works. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll have to reset up my file and I'll go through doing that with you guys right now as a kind of speed run. So I reopen flow. Right. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, I'm going to re import um, close rack settings are fine. Fine. We got this guy again. Um, I will import. <clears throat> now import our pattern one more time. I will cut out that part, delete. And th th this is the, the, the point that I think 
the student had a question about. So yeah, you can drag select to get all the geometry um, in the 2D pattern window. And then as you hover over it, you'll just right click on it. And what should come up is something that looks like this. And from this dialog box, we'll just click um, symmetric pattern <clears throat> with sewing. You can also do control D, I believe. Um, oh, it looks like my face has disappeared. That's okay. You can um, yeah, that's fine. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Are you moving? Are you moving anything around? Uh, I am now. Yes. Okay, okay. I can see. Okay, we're good. We just lost my face. Um, in a sea of green. <laughs> <laughs> Once this comes up, you'll just drag it over and click it at some point next to the original object. And now. This hopefully my GPU won't crash again. They're linked. So if I was going to shrink one object, the other one would shrink. Or if I've overlaid, for instance, as we'll get to later, um, a number of different types of sewing and seams, those would translate between these two objects. Um, and what we're going to do with these two is we are going to drag them over above the clothes rack. One above the other, but more or less um, aligned in terms of their endpoints and openings. And we are going to sew them together such that we can fill the space between them with air. Um, and this is actually pretty simple, but slightly tedious. Um, so the tool that we're going to be using is the second from the top right over on the 2D pattern window side, and it's called segment sewing. You can also use the keyboard shortcut of N. Um, and once you have this selected and you go back into the 3D view, you'll see that as you hover over different line work, you'll be able to select it. And so I'm going to select this line and the corresponding line above, and they should so together you'll get um, a colored pattern that shows how the seams are moving between the two. Sometimes you might have to double click on the second point. It's a little bit finicky. Um, and this, this purple notch that shows up is meant to um, make sure that you're aligning things correctly. So if I tried to try to snap one here and one there, it wouldn't sew, for instance. Um, but when they're next to each other, it will. And so I'm just going to go in a slightly tedious way and sew all these different parts. Of the object together. Um, and in, in the next tutorial, I'll go through some slightly faster workflows, but this, this is the easiest for now. So it looks like all of my seams are now together. Um, we have moved just a bit off from our frame. Though. So I'm going to move the closer act back underneath. And when we run the simulation this time, essentially what will happen is each of these lines is, which represents the sewing is essentially like a kind of magnet between these two points. And so these two textile planes will come, will come together and then drape over, um, drape over the closure rack. So I'm gonna press space bar or um, the button right up here to start the simulation. And there we go, there's our quilt on the clothes rack. Um, in order to have it be inflated, I will go back in history to before the point that I um, simulated it or just press Control-Z. Uh, and I will select um, both of the textiles and go into Property Editor. And under Simulation Properties, which we've been looking at before, um, there's an uh, option for pressure. We're going to get a, a positive pressure of around two. 
You can also give it negative pressure, which we'll do at the end of the tutorial, which essentially shrink wraps the textile around uh, an object. And so what should happen now is that it blows up a little bit. Oh, uh, it, is, it is too buoyant. <laughs> um, let's give it one. Okay. Well, this is be behaving differently than before, which is interesting. Um, what I'm going to do, because it's getting, um, it's freaking out uh, once, once the simulation runs, is I'm going to use that bend command that we did before to reposition stuff slightly more around the frame. So it was at the bottom left here. Um, I'll click on the center, the center seam and rotate it down and rotate it down. And then move these two guys over with gumball or selecting object. Oops, oops. Actually, actually, I'm going to do something different. Instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is let the simulation run before pressure is applied. Yeah. Let the simulation run before pressure is applied. And then while the simulation is still running, I will apply pressure. And let's give it something gentle, like one. Okay, see, this is already working a lot better. Two, oops, not 12. Oh, 12 will set, set us off again. Uh, <laughs> but essentially, these are the kind of um, affordances and accommodations you're going to have to go through in this and some more software where you're live simulating the behavior of materials. Um, and more often than not, you'll get something kind of unexpected, uh, like we're getting here. And at this point, because we only have a few minutes left, I'm just going to move on to the final tutorial. We, we still have like 15 minutes. Yeah, the, the last one is the, the, the hardest, so. Okay, yeah. We, we can figure out what's, what's going on. Maybe it's because of the update. Yeah, if, if you also if you go to the Rhino file, I have the sample, um, all the sample simulations in here, so you can see how geometries might perform. I, I hesitate to say that this is correct because I think um, that's maybe counter to some of the aims of the studio. Um, but essentially, you'll just spend a lot of time adjusting various settings and running simulations over and over again until you get something that you sort of like and can engage with critically. Um, so for this last part of the tutorial, we are going to be making a sort of 3D envelope around an object. In this case, um, it's a mug. Uh, and, and also of note is that um, you can use a lot of different, uh, you can import a lot of different kinds of geometries to, um, to Clo as a substrate by going through Rhino to convert them. So for instance, this was um, a, a poly surface, but we export it as a, a, a mesh um, to Clo because that's all it can read. Whereas this, um, this mug is like a photogrammetric mesh with textures applied. So if you guys are, for instance, scanning your objects, you can bring them into Rhino, put them into Clo uh, and play with them that way. You don't need to model them from scratch. You can also download stuff from 3D Warehouse, um, STL files, et cetera, et cetera. But this is our final pattern. So we'll do the same exporting process that we went through um, for our first pattern. Um, and instead of going through that twice, we're just going to toggle over to Clo, um, read all this, delete that, 
I'm going to open our mug. Again, it's an OBJ in the file tree. It is under OBJ photogrammetry shaving mug. We'll bring this in with the same settings. Add inch 100% align bottom to ground. <coughs> And it's come in. We are going to import our new pattern PDF. I'm not going to save anything. Um, and this time it is the mug garment pattern. Um, same setting. Cool. And so here, what we've essentially done in Rhino is we to make this pattern is we just extruded a profile such that it surrounds the mug. Um, what, you, what you'll do from that point is basically just unroll and explode everything into single surfaces, um, which you guys should be pretty familiar with. Um, typical workflow for like making models, for instance. And then in Clo, we're gonna bring all of these planes together by sewing all of their shapes together. Um, and it's a little tedious. We probably won't have time to go through the full thing, but I have, um, so this is an extra piece. I have a, a final version of what it should look like saved. So just, just like last time, we're gonna have to reposition all of these artifacts now in association with that we want them to be sewn around as well as with each other, which is a little tedious. So we're gonna bring this, Run the mug. And then based on how I've laid out the pattern, um, this is the bottom. We'll put that beneath. Um, also, I'm going to be doing sort of the same operation for a little bit. If there's questions, this is a good time to field them. Um, I had a question. Yeah, uh, it looks like it looks like in the Rhino file you had a version of the mug with the um, the clothing for the mug around yeah. it already. Yeah, exactly. And I was wondering if it's possible to import that so you don't have to in Clo like rotate everything again. Um, Yes, that's a super good question. It is possible to do that, but the, the reason I didn't do that in this case is because I wanted to show, is because it doesn't uh, import line with it. I wanted to do the difference between how we've been, um, let's say, modeling and pattern making stuff in close so far and the way in which you'll have to do it in the real world, which is that we've just been scene to scene as kind of butt connections in Clo, right? But when you're actually selling something, there are like it seem affordances, um, which is what this offset line work is. So what we'll be doing in this case and only against this object is sewing the corners of the other things to each other such that there's extra material around it. Um, and so I, I don't know if that makes sense. It'll probably make sense after next week. <laughs> We're actually having um the physical sewing tutorial right after this one today. Oh, perfect. Yes. So I, I'm sure they will get in to much greater detail about those sorts of things. Yeah, we're going to make but a bucket hat. If, if we weren't playing around with that detail, then yes, we could do that. Um, Great. Thank you. Any yeah. other questions? Yeah. Um, the question is, um, uh, it seems like the way you're moving things around is kind of like or like kind of arbitrary or imprecise, just yeah. using the gumball. Yeah. Is there a way to like be precise about the move, the like location of movements and snaps and stuff? Yeah, that's a really good question. Unfortunately, there's not really in flow. Um, that in one of the recent patch updates, they allowed you to snap rotations by pressing shift. Like I think I showed you guys before to 90 degree increments, which is useful. Um, the other 
the only other way in which you can completely snap is have nothing selected when you're in 3D view and grab a corner point so, sorry, of an object. Um, but even then it doesn't snap to anything else around it, but it's a little bit easier than a kind of center point gumball shift. Um, but no, you can't like move over 10 inches really. But you also don't need to the way the software, but like what the software is doing. Um, yeah, but yeah, it sounds like if you, it sounds like if you needed to be precise about things, then you would do it in Rhino first. Yeah, and just import it. Yeah, the the precision comes in Rhino, I would say. Okay. And there are also ways in which, and you'll again probably get into this in the physical pattern making, in which imprecisions, or you can be precise about imprecisions. Like, for instance, if this, um, the length of this side and the length of this piece of fabric were different, but we were sewing them together, all of a sudden that wouldn't necessarily be that, you know, it was, it was bad modeling or pattern making, but that the longer one would be sheared against the other one or start to be pleated. Um, and so there are, right. there are ways you can start to build in those kind of details um, that we'll get to in a second tutorial. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and it, it's also worth noting that you can also draft your patterns natively in Clow. I find their drafting to be a little bit clunky and I think based on you know the audience and my own expertise it's just a lot faster to draft uh, in Rhino a kind of vague pattern of, of what you're after at least in these initial stages probably in the next tutorial we'll be doing it a little bit more natively in in Blender or sorry in Flow itself. Um, I had another question in terms of the seam allowance which is that offset yeah does the does do you need to manually uh, draft that before, or does? Um, yeah, it's it's useful to natively draft or to draft that in Rhino, but you can also do it in Flow after the fact. And there's also a tool that lets you set um, seam allowances more globally. That again, we'll get into in the next tutorial. Um, okay, that's fine. Great. Okay, so we almost have this guy together. <laughs> um, we have a little under ten minutes left, and I'll start. I'll start sewing this one together, and then I'll just toggle over to my completed one because there were some other pressure variants that I wanted to play. Great. Okay, so let's just pretend that everything is more or less in its place. And what we'll do, essentially the exact same as last time is we'll be doing a segment sewing tool, which is second from the top over here, grab this corner. Again, this is the inset corner, and that corner, this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner. Um, and just go all the way around the object with that. What I'm going to open up now is the, the file where I've done all of that already. Um, and I will not save this guy. OK, so this is more or less what that looks like once we've started to run a simulation on it. Um, you can see here how the extra material um, is behaving. If we, one thing I think would be fun to play with is negative pressure. So I'm gonna go in and select all of the geometries from the 2D pattern window. Um, I'm gonna go into the property editor and I'm gonna use the pressure tab again, but I'm gonna make it like say negative three and I'll press space bar or click this button to run the simulation and it should just suck in Um, on the mug.
One of the frustrating differences between Flow and a software we learn later in the semester called Blender is there's not a timeline for the simulation in Flow in the same way that there is in Blender. So Blender, all of these moments where um, the simulation is running are kind of keyframes. So you can scroll between and choose what moment of the geometry you want to export. Whereas in Rhino, or sorry, in Flow, you can just press kind of start or pause. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply it even more. I'm gonna get negative twenty. Oh, I think I did positive twenty. Um, um but negative negative pressure is something that can be fun to play around with. Essentially, it can a lot of vacuum forming. And while you guys are, I guess, working through sewing those seams, I can field questions again. Um, and I, I would also, again, direct you to the tutorial document in the drive folder, um, especially the top of it, the useful commands um, come in handy, especially when you're you know, learning a new software and can't figure out how to navigate around it. It's useful to have those things just um, to be able to refer to quickly. I have a question. Um, so the students are, you know, th this this is part of a workflow um, that's including, you know, a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I I feel like this software is is good for like just testing out ideas, maybe before you actually physically cut everything out and yeah. um, make it. But also. Um, once you've finalized your your real pattern that you're sewing together or whatever, yeah. um, you can. Uh, it's kind of hard to draw <laughs> um, yeah. like the the final result if yeah. you know because yeah. yeah. So like, how how would you work this um, model into your workflow if you're going to make architectural drawings of like this scenario between the mug and the quilt? I see. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I, I think in the process of testing between flow and the physical models that you're making, et cetera, et cetera, you will come up with a, let's say, final model at some point in the semester. Re Redrafting or re-importing that pattern in a combination between Rhino and flow gives you the ability to export uh, and kind of document the artifact in digital space. and I can I can look more into that maybe for the next tutorial, um, the kind of documentation side of it. Because you can also do things like model or render natively in, in Flow, export simulations natively in Flow, these sorts of things. So it might be that in addition to it being sort of pattern making orthographic drawings, there are other forms of, of documentation that this thing can take um, through through the Flow workspace. Yeah. Okay. Um, cause yeah, they, they will be making like convention, uh, some conventional architectural drawings of like their thing. Um, so like, you know, it seems like you can export this scenario as it is right now into Rhino. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then in Rhino, if you were going to like, could you just treat it like any other Rhino thing and just make 2D and all the other things they've learned over the years to yeah, just treat it. it like I understand the question better now. Yeah, so it'll just come in as, as meshes. Um, and so meshes, as I'm sure you guys know, are a little tricky with make 2 d You might have to convert to polysurf, et cetera, et cetera. But it will come in as Rhino geometry that you can document through, you know, make 2 d blah, 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 blah. Um, OK. Yeah. That's great. And um, maybe. Uh, are there any other questions at all for now? Um, uh, so we're still, uh, we might have a couple minutes before Laura, who's doing the physical tutorial, arrives. Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to share um, some of your some of your work. Oh, um, sure. I I might have to turn my camera back on. I think the um, 
the, the fashion peppery fist spread that I edited that we were talking about before might be cool to just look at in the interim. I'll stop sharing screen. Let's see if video will start one more time. Yeah, I can see you now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so as I I think I expressed at the beginning, I'm, I'm super interested in this video for a number of reasons. The being is that I've been with oh, shit. I've disappeared again. Um, I'm obsessed with backgrounds, intersections with architecture for a while. Um, and it's been a bit. Oh my God. I'm on a USB connected webcam, so it's quite. So what I might do instead is just show the publication on the Paprika website rather than showing the one that is right next to me in the room. Um, and I had the opportunity last spring to edit an issue of guest edit, because I'm not a student there, an issue of Yale's um, Paprika, which is oftentimes a weekly broadsheet. It's a collaboration between the Yale School of Architecture students and the Yale graphic design MFA students where a set of architecture students will um, edit an issue on a sort of topical theme, ours being fashion, and then they will collaborate with um, graphic design students to um, produce and print the issue. Uh, you can see my screen now? Yes. Um, and the spread we did is the fashion issue. We had a lot of interesting contributors, including um, uh, Mira and Matthew Henry, who I referenced at kind of the beginning of the class, who do a lot of work with Clo. Um, this would be a really, really good interview, I think, for you guys to read as you start to get your hands on um, uh, or minds. They have to read it. Oh, they do. Okay, that. great. Um, so this this is how you read it. <laughs> you go to the website, and uh, if if I'm in person at, at some point over the course of the semester, I'll also bring a few physical copies of the issue with me. Um, but the spread itself, this is the PDF, was designed. Oh my goodness, so heavy. Designed as a sheet of pattern making paper with a pattern drafted on top of it. So the grid of um, numbers and letters in blue printed that you see above is what um, essentially pattern making paper for garment construction uh, looks like because it allows you easily reference sort of quadrants as you're making the pattern. Um, and we laid out the issue according to the pattern of a t-shirt that the graphic designer sort of hand drafted and and then scanned in the images. Um, if you zoom in with pins through them, here we have um, Missy Elliott pinned the t-shirt. Um, and then what this invited people to do with the issue afterwards was to actually assemble it into a sort of physical t-shirt, zine, garment hybrid. Um, and we worked with, um, Kevin McCaughey, who runs uh, a brand called Boot Boys Biz that some of you might be familiar with, which is essentially um, taken the supreme hype drop culture and moved it towards like architectural and design artifacts. So we'll have a t-shirt that, um, for instance, or here it's a hat that talks about Rainer Bannon, or it'll be a Gordon Maddox Clark long sleeve graphic tee, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we did a collaboration of merch for the issue with him where we upcycled uh, a series of thrifted vintage Yale merchandise and um, in some cases printed the issue one-to-one -one scale on the t-shirt. Uh, and then here's an example of the t-shirt kind of assembled. I wish I could show you the one in my room right now. But the oh. Now, now the, the video is back on. Okay, let's let's see if I can <laughs> let's see if I can get this work. Um, can we still see you?
Okay. The, the reveal. <laughs> They're for real. I'll take it off the wall. Uh, oh, and I will grab the. Uh... So, one one of, one of the things that I think might be interesting to play around with in this studio, especially as you're using materials and cutting physical patterns, is the kind of leftover. So, in this case, here's the remainder of the T-shirt cut out from the um, from the spread. And then here's the t-shirt sort of itself. This is kind of a poor excuse for a show and tell over Zoom, but hopefully a better one later in the semester. Um, you could put that on a dog, like a chihuahua. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is dog scale. <laughs> chihuahua t-shirts. Um, that's awesome. Thanks so much for showing that. And um, I think this was a really great initial tutorial, um, just to get the students to feel more comfortable experimenting with it in their own time before they get another um, tutorial from you. Um, but yeah, I, I loved that. I think it's really exciting. And um, I'm just I'm excited <laughs> still. So, um, uh, cool, thank you so much for your time, Ian. That was really amazing. Can we get a round of applause from everybody? Yay, Ian. Okay, thanks so much, Ian. Um, and I'll be in touch uh, shortly. That was really great. All right, thank you guys. Um, enjoy your next tutorial. Okay, thanks, Ian. Bye, have a good day. Thanks to you all as well.